You were a spiritual child. <laughs> uh huh. <laughs> Special little boy. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Irenacast. I'm your host, Jeff, and with me is my co host, Alan. Yeah, I am. Yeah, he is. On the first and third Tuesday of every month, we bring to you our perspectives on theology and culture from a post-evangelical lens. Thank you for joining us for another conversation to provoke your progressive Christian imagination. This week, we are joined once again by Bonnie Rambob. She is back. You may remember Bonnie from our Intersections episode, episode 113, and our discussion on poverty and protest from episode 123. And um, in addition to all of that, Bonnie wears many hats. She is a co-pastor of Parkside Community Church. She is a credentialed teacher who's taught everywhere, everything from elementary school to junior high to high school. She co-founded Peace Village San Mateo. Is that correct, Bonnie? Is that how you pronounce it? Yeah, that's it. Yes. It is an interfaith peace education day camp for kids ages 7 to 13, as well as an interfaith leadership program for high school youth and college students. She has presented workshops on topics such as the spirituality of parenting, race, and young children. And concerning this week's episode, today's uh, topic, Nurturing the Spiritual Child. Uh, And for our segment, we are going to be doing a top three. We're going to get to know each other a little bit. Top three childhood fears. Uh, So... Bonnie, again, welcome. Thank you so much for for coming back on the show. I think we hinted on the last episode you were at that we would talk a little bit about this. And we've had several listeners over the past few months write in about uh, parenting and what do you do as a parent when you've been in flux? How do you not bring your kids into your own deconstruction and impose that on that? Like layers, I'm sure, that are going to go into this conversation. Um, so, uh, So, yeah. So, Bonnie, when you say nurturing the spiritual child Let, let's start there what is what does that mean how do we how do we unpack that a little bit yeah thanks so much for this opportunity i'm really excited to share as you can tell from all the things that i've done in my life i've been super interested in kids and youth families parenting and now that i'm a mom of a 22 and 25 year old um, wonderful 22 <laughs> and 25 year olds i think that alone uh, it makes me excited to listen to you about this subject because I've interacted with your children. And I'm like, oh my god, oh, I gotta so. listen to Bonnie for some advice. Yeah, I don't, I don't feel at all like it makes me an expert because I made so <laughs> many mistakes along the way. But I, you know, I kind of have that 2020 vision a little bit, which is helpful, I think, um, when thinking about kids growing up. So yes, nurturing the spiritual child, Lisa Miller. Some of you might know have written has written a book and it was recently published called The Spiritual Child. And in it is tons of research about uh, how kids grow up and how we have a spirit that she calls inherent and that it provides us with assets for dealing with life's real difficult challenges and for also experiencing deep joy and contentment. And so if that is true, if we are inherently or innately spiritual beings, then nurturing that process of growing up and developing that spiritual side of ourselves is what I want to talk about. And that's Mm. what I mean by nurturing the spiritual child. I think for a lot of people who are progressive or maybe have left more fundamentalistic Christianity, the word spirituality itself is kind of loaded. And I'm interested in definitions of spirituality. I've heard of everything from like awareness and presence being a spirituality that that someone has. Um, And of course, kids are aware and present in certain ways. And, uh, I've also heard of like in the clinical setting, doing work at the hospital, spirituality being three things across the board, whatever religion or no religion, um, self-worth, community, and purpose, like senses of those things build into spirituality. When you talk about like kids being spiritual, it sounds like at least Lisa Miller and, and for you, there's something else that's there. If you unpack it, like that goes beyond kind of the clinical definition, right? Yeah, I guess it's a different or it's definition. It's a different angle yeah. on it. Yeah. Um spirituality as 
defined by me and Lisa Miller is a sense of close relationship to the transcendent, whatever language we might use for that, which is ineffable, right? Unspeakable. You know, in the more Judeo-Christian culture, probably it's like an interactive relationship, you know, like a personal devotional relationship. And for those of us who have fundamentalist backgrounds, you know, we understand that like through prayer, we have this relationship with the transcendent or through some kind of worship service or something like that. The more Eastern traditions probably see it more as like oneness, like a sense of being part of all. The unity. Yeah. And but that's still transcendent because it's still something that's beyond ourselves. And another like the Native American traditions, it's like the transcendent other, like a connection to ancestors or a connection to the natural world in which, you know, all things in the natural world are sort of imbued with this divine. So, so Bonnie, I would imagine uh, after our conversation last week uh, on Halloween with your husband Raj and and all of, all of the things that he shared with us, I would imagine that the term as a parent, spirituality, has shifted and changed in a lot of ways. And as you are nurturing your own spiritual child, and as that was changing, you were also littering, literally nurturing children, um, which uh, seems like a, a difficult task to balance those things. Uh, so for for you, how has that definition of spirituality changed into the one you have now? And then what were some of the more profound impacts that that had on you and your children as you you parented through that whole deconstruction phase of, of your life? I guess deconstruction and reconstruction. Yeah. Um, oh, it's so complicated, right? Um, that's why we have an hour long podcast. So yeah. that's, a- <laughs> and that's why we have people in like, we had several people from Australia be like, Hey, will you please do an episode on this? And both of us were like, yeah, we need it. <laughs> like neither of us have talked about this cause it is complicated. Yeah. And I would say that probably, um, if you're a parent and you have found yourself in a different spiritual tradition, than the one that you grew up in, that's going to impact parenting. Like, there's no way for it not to. You may be cynical about the former tradition, and you may hear things, you know, that other people say and remark remark about it in front of your kids or whatever, and they take all of that in. So um, in my case, Raj and I, we grew, we were like really embedded in our former community. We were teachers in the Seventh-day Adventist tradition We um, followed all of the curriculum, the Bible curriculum, and even though we didn't completely buy it, hook, line, and sinker, we certainly bought enough of it that we wanted our kids to grow up in that tradition. And then when my oldest was about nine and my youngest was six, I began to really feel at odds with this theology that I inherited. And... um, what triggered that for you, if that's okay to derail the conversation? Yeah, you know what triggered it for me is um, never being able to respond authentically to an altar call and always feeling like there's something wrong with me because I am not having this come to Jesus moment. Did Have you had – because I'm assuming that at, at a certain point, everyone in the family was – on board, or at least on and the outward expression of on board when it came to Seventh Day Adventism, fundamentalism, all of that. Um, how was that shift different? So, for you, would you classify it as like a rebirth where you felt you had to like re nurture your spirit? And then have you had conversations, especially with your children later on, on what was the first thing to go for them and how, what was their perspective in that, that transition as you went along? If that's not, you know, too personal to ask. I, Well, I think, and this is why studying about the spirituality of children, I think, has really um, been useful. And I think it's important for everyone, whether we are needing to go back into our own childhoods and reflect on who we were as children and how we developed spiritually, or whether we're parenting or in relationships with kids. Um, I think that, you know, as when you're young, these concrete stories 
and sort of a set of beliefs that a community believes together is actually really helpful to our spiritual development. And so as this was beginning to unravel for me, which was kind of like I was going through an adolescent period, really, of spiritual, you know, individuation. individuation. Exactly. Yay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And um, but I was doing it with six and nine year old and as their mom. So when they really needed those those stories and that community and this, you know, myth of Jesus being born in the world or whatever. This is this was our community story. Um, I was telling them, oh, wait a second. We don't believe that anymore in this family. So it was really confusing to them. And um, I think that it's really tempting to sort of, as a parent, when you realize, oh my God, this is like super, this has been super hurtful. And I want to get rid of it, all of it. I want to remove any sort of trace of it in my family's life, um, that that is like spiritual whiplash for our kids. And I think that my kids have been able to sort of process that with me, not until their late teens, though, because, you know, they were they were along for the ride and they didn't really have a lot of opportunity to really think about it in an adult sort of way until they were in their late teens. So with 2020 hindsight how what would you do differently like what how would you how would you prevent or ease some of that whiplash as you as you head into that if you were heading into that now um i would have i would have understood it better for what it for what it is that myth and ritual and faith community are important in the lives of kids instead of just ripping it out of our family's life i would have spent more time thinking about how I could interpret it or make meaning of it in a different way. Um, So would would you transfer that ritual? So I'm I'm thinking in terms of like, okay, so let's say I'm a family, we're all entrenched and maybe entrenched, well, entrenched into this religious community. And, you know, my wife and I, we start having doubts and we're moving into this place. Now we, we just need to pull out completely and not be a part of this. There's that side of, okay, well, what's good for our kids? Because I know a lot of parents, they go to churches that they don't agree with because they have great Mm -hmm. programs for their children and all that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, you may not be willing to do that, especially if part of your own deconstruction is clouded with abuse or I'm I'm sure as a woman being put in a certain – you know, in a certain place as far as your leadership and what abilities you're able to do in the church. So would you would you say that part of that ritual is that things you can bring into a new context if you don't find like a necessarily a spiritual community? Like how do you create those rituals at home when you when there's no way you can be in that church setting any longer because of all of the levels that are involved in that outside of just the deconstruction? Yeah, I think creating rituals at home or or finding a couple other families, maybe. Part of developing a core spirituality is sort of understanding family, first family. And family can be defined in so many different ways. Basically, basically it's who are the adults in the child's life along with the child that make up a core unit that are responsible for helping this child grow up. And that that fits one of the criteria of the clinical definition, right? Like community. What are people who are people connected to? And so making sure your kids have We're not a wealth interested of that. in clinical definitions, Alan. We're yeah, interested we in biblical definitions. Which I know, is if people man, have some woman, of them. <laughs> children, three bedroom house, America. <laughs> <laughs> right. so yeah, I, I would yeah. They, I mean, honestly, if my parents had moved us out of our church, I would have lost a lot of community. Right. And and See, that's the thing, right, is that these are people that you've taught your children are – these are the people that you have sleepovers at their house. and Not just they're... that, safe to look up to mm-hmm. and want to exactly. be like. Exactly. Exactly. So uh, it's a complicated process when the parents decide that that is no longer a good fit for them or when it's completely untenable, they can't abide by it any longer. And it's painful because there's – um the grieving process that the adults go through. And so the children obviously observe that and can tell that there's something different about their parents. Um, And now all of a sudden they're sort of pulling back and 
more, the relationships are more estranged and all of that impacts kids. So, um, well, just to clarify for our listeners and maybe for me, maybe you two disagree, but you know, just because there's been a theological shift, it doesn't mean that still some of those people in conservative settings are not valuable people for your children to still look up to. They still have a lot to mm-hmm. offer as examples. It's just, it may be a pause thing while you figure out how to maneuver through a foundational shift and how different you two may be or all that kind of stuff. But, you know, I think there's still obviously value in everyone, even if we don't agree in that. Absolutely. Just, the only reason I said it that way is like, in my experience, you get disinvited to relationships. So right. It's like, right. And I know that that's, that's more indicative, I think, of the, the structure than the actual people. And I think hopefully there's times where you can get back to that place where they can be. Anyway, I just wanted to clear that before they moved yeah. on because I don't want to I don't want to present that, you know, for sure. Yeah, we don't want to. It's I think definitely for our podcast, we've come to a place where a lot of us value the people and even some of the things we were taught in our former contexts. And it's not like a a poo pooing session. <laughs> right. 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 Past. Right. Like, so I, I get that. Yeah. And definitely because I think, you know, to help us, our kids develop spiritually, we want to create this field of love. Lisa Miller mm. calls it a field of love. And that, can be part of your that's your core family whatever however that unit is configured and then a few others as well and if you can be part of a spiritual community it doesn't have to be a church but it can be maybe other people who are having questions about the same kinds of things and that's interesting to hearing you say that like the community field of love like creating that it's almost like that bootstraps to the transcendent like if I'm not safe and there is not a community for me to experience that interconnectedness with, it's going to seriously affect my ability to feel that with the like with nature, with the wider world. Absolutely. Interesting. And we're, we are wired for that. And that's, you know, that's where this na- idea of natural spirituality or inherent spirituality comes from. So it starts there. And in many ways, the first transcendent relationship that a child has is with a parent Mm -hmm. or some other figure in their lives where it's an outside of them experience. They're connected to this other being outside of themselves. And so is healing that the work for all of us? Healing that like relationship with our first family, whatever we think about our parents, like. I mean, not not of us had not all of us had great parents. I definitely appreciate my parents; they're fantastic. But I worked with a lot of people who like that's not the case. And if that's like our first experience of transcendence, maybe going through the hard work of healing that, and however we choose to go to heal that, like maybe that's a key to start being better spiritual parents for our children is somehow not carrying on that like disconnect into the next generation. Well, I think, you know, healing that those that relationship is certainly if you can do it, that's wonderful. But like I said, some children, many children, I think, have a sense pretty early on to something beyond their parents. And sometimes that relationship, like the relationship with the universe, the relationship with trees can in some ways provide a similar sort of nurturing field of love experience if the parental relationship is harmful. And if we can keep that spirituality going throughout our lives and develop it over time, it provides us with assets for handling things that are really difficult in life and for making meaning out of life. Being attentive to our children's spiritual development through the first decade of their lives and then certainly through their adolescent years as parents or as people who are in relationship with children is really essential. And in my kids' experience, having them go from one, you know, we were, like I said, embedded, entrenched, whatever word you want to use in this faith community. And then um, to tell the kids, well, they were, they were in school and everything. So it was seven days a week, almost 24 hours a day. They were embedded in the social world. And then to say, well, I know your teacher might be telling you that, but that's not what we believe anymore. It's true. It was true at the time. And it was important that our kids knew that we were transitioning out of thinking that way. However, I think perhaps I could have 
sunk more into the myth. There's so many great stories in the the Judeo and you're not myth. and you're not saying myth in a negative pejorative sense. You're saying it in a useful sense. The the religious stories that we yeah. grew up with, yeah. You know, there's so much in in there that I could have drawn from that I could have used with my kids that would have felt probably less like whiplash and more like, oh, we're changing, we're morphing, but we're not being yanked or pulled up from the roots. The difficulty there is, though, is if you haven't come to your reframing yet, because what you're talking about is reframing the stories in a different way that serves your family's spiritual needs. If you're not in a place to reframe your own tradition, it's really hard to do that for your kids if you haven't gone down that path yet. Because you're you're a minister at a church, like you your your understanding of Christianity is different now than it was before, and it's something you live and breathe and you offer to people. Um, but like you weren't there when you were going through your <laughs> your changes, you know, you didn't know what tools there were to use in the future. Right. But if but if I had heard this, I would have mm. tried to work on that. You would have had permission and an idea of what. To, that's interesting. So th- along with all that, there's something I would like to run by you, Bonnie, because uh, you're more experienced in this field. And this is something that I've been ruminating on for I don't know, at this point, maybe a couple of years. But one of the things that was striking to me when I was a youth pastor was how I never met one single youth pastor, not one, who read any books on just adolescent development. Not one. And when I would say, hey, check this book out and explain what it was, I would get this blank stare like, well, why would I do that? You know, I have, I have the purpose-driven youth ministry. That's all I need. You know, whatever. <laughs> really? What? Yeah. You, not so one. Jeff, when Jeff was a youth pastor, I was a youth pastor, and we had lots of conversations, and I was kind of following him a little bit. It like in in years, I was behind him, um, and going through a lot of the similar experiences. Just a few years later, like we talked about adolescent development all the time, all and the read time. books and shared books together and stuff. I didn't realize that other people weren't doing that with you. No, no one. Huh. No one was. That was something I had to discover on my own, I feel like. Even early on in that context, I had this sense of, okay, there has to be this melding of the the spiritual and the physical. Like, And now that I'm past this and I have younger kids myself trying to figure out how things are working, it's been very helpful for me to link spiritual development with physical development, right? So I feel comfortable talking about the Bible and the stories in scripture as fact, because that's what their brains understand, right? And then waiting for them to ask questions to know what cue to move on to that next level. So the problem is, is and I see this in progressive churches, not just um, evangelical conservative churches. I don't want people to leave what I'm about to say by thinking, well, evangelicalism is childish. And if you really want to be a mature Christian, you need to be here. I think I think they're all childish. So <laughs> just in terms of like the religious institution. So when you're in Sunday school, you're taught appropriate for your for your development as a person, mental, physical, all that kind of stuff. How the you you're taught the Bible stories as true stories. Um which is great, you know, when you're but when you start getting to that age where you're asked questions and then the church institutions either double down by telling you you have to believe it or my experience on more progressive mainline churches is still use the same words and the same way that they approach scripture that they did with the kids, like just presenting it without any context, presenting it in terms of reading and all that kind of stuff, is that at a certain point, the church, they're not guiding people spiritually as they are moving physically into adolescence, into young adulthood, into adulthood. It's it's really frustrating because I've had a lot of conversations with people recently that, you know, they come away from a Sunday morning service and they're like, well, we're, we just we just read the Bible or we're, we're using the same language. And and when I have a class or I'm sitting in a home group and I'm trying to explain the nuance of scripture or how to approach this and all that kind of stuff, everyone says, wait a minute, why don't we ever talk about that in church? Is that they were left at the flannel graph, at the flannel graph. Yeah. spiritually and never given something else except for just be involved in big church or the main service without a whole lot. And I'm not saying that's true for every church, but it seems to be a pretty huge experience. And, and you two as ministers, I'm, I'm sure you've, you've seen the same thing in, in movements towards church is that. I want to echo that. Honestly, the progressive church, mainline church has really failed adolescents in my experience. I've, I've interacted with a lot of them. I hear that like lack of spiritual development 
in that area of life is a real freaking thing. And as, and as, and as harmful as some of my evangelical and fundamentalistic experiences were, that was not the case when it came to adolescence. There was a wealth of elders. There was a wealth of resources and in investing inside of the discipleship of like, we don't have discipleship for youth and young adults <laughs> in mainline like settings. That's so, that's, so I guess that's right. scary. All of that kids. to say, Bonnie is where for you, where should parents and churches, not that you're offering a formula, but at least like, you know, a direction sign, where should and how should parents or even churches really be aware of how their spiritual development and their physical development are linked and what things can we do to nurture both as they move along with each other? Yeah, I, that's a great question. I want to go back to something that you said, um, Jeff, about reading stories to our kids, Bible stories to our kids as if they're true. And it, it sounded like you equated true and fact as being the same kind of thing. True from their perspective, right? Like you present it as it is, as it is. Like f when I sit down and talk to my daughter about, you know, no. someone from scripture, no. <laughs> let's say Adam and Eve, you yeah. know, I'll just, as a matter of fact, like I don't need to add the caveat of, well, this could be this or whatever, but I would talk to the same, them to the same way about Supergirl, right? Like well, what is Supergirl doing right now? Well, she's probably fighting crime somewhere. Like it's. It's the story that they're connecting with and the 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 whole idea of like fact and fiction is something that I think we impose on children. But for them, it's just – it's all part right. of it. They're not at that place to discern the two necessarily. Uh, right. I, yeah, exactly. Um, but also I think that, that we can give them a little bit more credit for understanding how the – what's imaginary and what's real in the world are connected. Right. Yes. And I think it was – Maybe Albert Einstein, who said, if you want your children to be smart, read them fairy tales. And if you want them to be really smart, read them more fairy tales. And I, I kind of think that, you know, the, the myth, I'm using that word because it's not about whether it's true or not. It's about, in a factual sense, but whether or not it's true in the deeper sense. And I think that Bible stories are great resources. For us to draw from in, you know, yeah, in talking to our kids about things that really matter in life. So, yes, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. We just read the story and let them sort of guide the interpretive process of what it means to them. But appropriately edit it, right? Like there's a reason that there's, you know, there's not a bloody cross on the flannel graph, right? You, you you skip to the resurrection. But the problem is, is that that's how we've kept it even for adults is that we don't you know, upgrade the flannel graph to with something more like intense and, and nuanced and all that kind of stuff. And uh, that that's that's been an issue for me recently. Like even delving into the psychology of why we need scapegoats in our like right. psychosocial right. Right. Like, realities that are around us. That would be a more adult discipleship <laughs> that takes you into that. Well, we use, I mean, even scapegoat itself, right, is a term that comes from a story. And and it's used. We all know what it means, but we don't often know what what is the deeper origin of that term and how is it? How it's actually is it? appeasing the the god in the desert. <laughs> like right. There's this demon god in the desert that you send your <laughs> lamb off to. And right. We don't yeah. even know where that comes from. And now it's become a sociological or psychological term. But yeah, I, I, I wasn't even referring to the term. I'm thinking more of like you said, Bonnie, this like kind of deeper truth. You said something about the connection between imaginary and like physical world, like concrete stuff, how the interplay between those two is actually deeply meaningful and good and like human. I think a lot of times for those of us who've moved away from being told Genesis one through three is scientific history. And then once we discover <laughs> it's not <laughs> like, like, well, screw this, like you're just going to throw it all out. And the, and the idea is that no, these human culture and the things that we create, there's an emergent effect where like there's real entities of like community and history and spirituality that is created by the stuff that we do. Right. I mean, like these, these realities that we like, even the idea of America or the idea of McDonald's or something like that is a reality that has been created. It's a thing in the universe because it's happening between people in our brains. It's, it's like, it's an emergent effect. And so these realities that are, that are bigger, uh, interacting with that transcendent kind of thing 
um, there's actually worth and value there. And I think a lot of progressive people are like, well, I don't want to touch any of that because I've seen it used in a really harmful and misleading way. Yes, I, I think that's exactly right. But it takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of work when it has been used to harm someone, uh, not just to deconstruct. It's more like a, a process of merging one's new understanding with things that one was taught growing up and actually doing the work of like parsing out what's valuable mm. and what's not valuable. And as a parent, you're dealing with so many, you're, you're doing that anyway. You're doing that in so many other ways. Like you're always looking at the way you were brought up and you're always evaluating, okay, what was helpful in the way that I was brought up that I would like to pass on to my children? And what do I want to just leave behind? And I'm saying perhaps add the religious dimension of our lives or the spiritual dimensions of our lives to that same sort of evaluate, evaluative process for the sake of our kids. You know, after having my kids reflect back to me um, how difficult it was to be yanked out of not just community, and they weren't yanked out of community like fully. We were still connected to lots of people and we still are, but ideologically and spiritually, that field of love that I really wanted them to have as sort of a solid foundation became shaky ground. And that's difficult. You know, that's really difficult for kids. And I also wanted to say something about the adolescent spiritual development, which you brought up, Jeff, earlier, like a lot of youth pastors don't know anything about adolescent development. Uh, they they think, I, I guess, you know, the youth pastors that I hung out with uh, often thought that it was sort of on the job learning. Like <laughs> you did right. something, right? You did something, you saw how the the uh, student or the teenager responded, and there you go. Now you know now you know about adolescent development. According to research, adolescents are very spiritual. Like there's a window of opening towards spirituality during adolescence that is not as profound at any other time in our lives. I agree with you wholeheartedly, Alan, that the progressive Christian church is failing our adolescents. Mm -hmm. And I think it's largely because of what you were saying, Jeff, that we haven't done, we haven't taught people how to take these stories and actually make meaning out of them for their own lives. I think and a so lot of progressive Christian churches don't even know themselves as adults and even with ministers, like how how it impacts their own discipleship. They may know how it impacts politics. They may know how it impacts reading the news and like interacting with the bigger realities in a prophetic way. But how does all this personal discipleship of my own spirituality, how does like this impact that? There's a big gap there in my mind. Right. So what happens is we teach them all the Bible stories, or I mean, sometimes we don't even do that in Sunday school. It's more like character development or which is all good stuff, but it's not necessarily always connected even to the the ancient, these ancient texts. They sort of learn that stuff and then they get to be 10, 11 years old. And then kids will say, yeah, I don't believe that anymore. I believe in science. And that's kind of the end of it. Right. Yeah. Well, and it's, forgive the upcoming rant, but it's also that most adults in church, they get to a certain place and the only framework they have, the only narrative they have for adolescence in their church is the the glorified news about how social media is awful and everyone's connected to their devices and all that kind of stuff. And then that's just imposed on young people in the church and because they have a negative view of that, they just – it's either you come to us and do what we ask you to do or you're not welcome. I, they don't say that explicitly, but that's exactly what it is. Oh, we want our young people in church. Well, then make the church and the service more applicable to where they're at and take the time, take the damn time to learn about their world, to learn about their culture, to ask them questions and get to know who they are before you start imposing any kind of spiritual or discipleship or whatever onto them, expecting them to, to, to fall in line. Regardless of – and this is true, evangelical or progressive. Like this is just – it seems to be a generational thing that uh, a lot of young, older generations have just bought into these sensationalized stories about how young people are this and that. I mean look at all the – and we've had episodes on this, but look at all the crap that's been out there on millennials and, and you know. Right. Uh, it's, yeah. it's, it's ridiculous. I hear a common thread through both of what you're saying. Like 
exploring the spirituality of individuals is an important part of faith work, an important part of religious work. It's an important and part like, of our spirituality, right? Like if we, yeah. can't, if we can't learn to connect our spiritual stories <laughs> and right. appreciate someone's story for what it is, like we can sit here all, the, all, the, all we want and say, we'll listen to people from the LGBTQ community. We'll listen to people who have had experience with race and all this kind of stuff. And that'll be the things that we put out there as progressives. But under it, when was the last time we sat down with a with a teenager or a younger person and asked them and really accepted their story? Because we seem to be fine if it's other adults for the most part, at least with our rhetoric, but not so much when it's kids and adolescents because we, we devalue them. And we don't even realize it and we probably never would admit it. But we do with our rhetoric. We do with our structures. We do with everything. And it's just ridiculous. I was never ta- taught to appreciate the spirituality of kids. <laughs> Their innate spirituality. No. Like, that's yeah. totally except for the Except for the cliche like the Jesus invited the kids over and all that kind of stuff. And then we throw out a little you know, children's moment to Let accommodate. The, Jesus, the yeah. kids come to me. Right. Yeah. But, but not as they are. Not in exploring who they are. Not – holding up their spirituality is worth like I would affirm the worth of children growing up. That's what we were taught, but their, their spirituality, even saying their spirituality, I've never heard that said in church before. Never once. That's so sad. Isn't it? Yeah. That's <laughs> yeah. so sad. And I would wager to bet that some people when they, if they ever heard that would scoff and maybe even audibly mm-hmm. laugh at the idea of a, uh, of kid spirituality. And we're spending, we spent, so much money and so many volunteer hours on children in my former like VBS Sunday school, like children's church, all this kind of stuff. And I never heard the word <laughs> children's spirituality like right. that's or they matter. You're a part of what we're doing. Right. Like stuff like that, like little Anyway, I, th- I think – sorry. I think I've you, taken yeah, us off preach. track. I mean, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm right with you. I, I, what, I was, what I was going to add is you know, some of this research that's been done um, by Lisa Miller and folks around spirituality. She did a lot of work on adolescent spirituality and the window of development that's available to parents and to the broader culture to actually walk with adolescents and help them to develop their spirit, their, this core spiritual spirituality, which will serve them for the rest of their lives. I mean, just think about how much we're having to go back and heal that perhaps if someone had put some intention into our growing up years, we would be able to do things in the world that we can't because we're having to go back and heal. One thing that these researchers found, what though, and in, in researching like thousands of adolescents from all over the country in many different faith traditions, it wasn't just in Christianity, is that over and over and over again, the um, adolescents who were interviewed said, "Nobody ever asked me these questions before." Mm-hmm. That that breaks my heart. Yeah, that's and really it's just hard to hear. Basic questions like. Do you have a sense of the transcendent? And if so, tell me about it. I feel like those kinds of questions and conversations were like foundational to my entire time as as a youth minister, even within yeah. a religious context. Like, I, you know, in terms of providing something for young people, you know, it's always de- dependent upon the leader because there's a bit of a cult of personality in there. But at the same time, at least a space was provided for them that was that was theirs. And uh, man, that. That was the best part of youth ministry is you got to ask those for like for Jeff and for at least for Jeff and I, like I saw your ministry firsthand. So I know yours was like mine. Um, Getting to ask all those questions was the best part of youth ministry. Big church sucked because nobody was like asking individuals, hey, what is your sense of God? Do you have one? Is it different than mine? Like, but youth group was like, that was every single youth group we ever had. I never thought to ask that question of children. I've never worked with children. I don't have children. Like, this is all new to me. But I can see how even asking that question of a child is okay. Uh, Yes, it's okay. And not only that, but perhaps if we help them to integrate how help them integrate science what they're learning about science and also what they sort of know in their hearts about spirit, then when they become 10 and 11, maybe they don't need to say it's either or, you know, maybe we don't they don't need to think about this binary, even of imaginary and real or factual. And maybe they don't need to feel like the world, oh, there's only two options, science or spirituality. Right. Well, man, 
I feel like, like a you know, series. This, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> this is something we definitely we should we should revisit later. Um, and you know, guiding that that revisit. Send us your questions. If you're you're listening to this conversation, there's so many layers to parenting, and I'm sure there's so many places where people are at. Whether you're a, a same sex couple raising a child, or whether you've had deconstruction in the midst of raising your children, like Bonnie, or or whether you're in my place where you've gone through all that and now you're raising kids in a progressive context, and you find yourself lamenting the the community that was established in a lot of those uh, more conservative settings. Like wherever you are in that, send us your questions because we really want to uh, make this an ongoing conversation. So before we close out this particular portion of the podcast, Bonnie, are there any like helpful tips or, th- or, or resources that you can direct people to, to really begin to explore these kind of things more, more meaningfully. And then like, and again, any specific tips as far as like, try these things, they might be helpful. I want to nuance at. something you just said, Jeff, before Bonnie gives all the resources and stuff. Um, also, not just questions, but stories. We love hearing like what your stories of of parenting or right. your transitions are. So feel free to share those on our Facebook page and we'll all read them. Yeah. It's, thank you so much for this opportunity to talk about this. And you're right. There's so much more. <laughs> there's so much more. And I'd, I'd love to also hear what people's stories are um, because I think we learn from each other's mistakes as well as from each other's um, successes and you know things we're proud of. But I would totally recommend reading Lisa Miller's book, The Spiritual Child. There are some great tips in there for parenting and uh, spiritually parenting uh, kids. That means not just the parents that are in the home, but those of us adults who... Ad- have children that we're sort of responsible for that aren't our own children. I also uh, recommend as much as possible using sacred language in just everyday life. Take moments to think about gratitude. Help kids slow down by taking a few deep breaths and um, allowing their minds to go to a place that's calm and peaceful. Create rituals with your family kids find rituals to be so helpful to them, especially when life seems really crazy and chaotic, which is pretty much every family's life um, in the world today. Um, And with that, before we move on, how how explicit should you be about it being a ritual? Do you find children pick up like just the routine of it as a ritual? And then that comes later. Like, you know, like when you're in a religious setting, it's very specific uh, how specific should you be, or does that not really matter? Yeah, I think uh, the more language, sacred language that we can give our kids, that's part of our role as parents. So using the word ritual. Okay. Like, so you think framing really it with sad. language is important? We're sad that, you know, a pet died or whatever. Um, how can we create a ritual that will help us to remember how much we loved this pet? And then together, do that. Um And then children will begin to come and say, I need a ritual. This is going on in my life. It empowers them to claim their own spirituality and to continue to develop that and learn about it as they grow up. That's so psychologically healthy. That's powerful. That really is. So those are just a few things. But maybe we'll have to talk about this again sometime. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. I know. I know. Kat, my partner is listening. And, uh. If you if if I haven't already, write this down. Ritual for the kids. <laughs> You're talking to her. I'm talking to you. <laughs> You're this offloading the audience of one right now. <laughs> I, I've already uh, added Lisa Miller's uh, book on my Goodreads list. So good. <laughs> if can you want to say- add us, add us as friends on Goodreads, we can share book resources. That's always fun. And a couple of other things too. When you are working with your kids and accompanying them on their spiritual journeys, think of yourself as a fellow journey partner, not so much as the teacher and mentor, especially if you are in the process of deconstruction. And I'm sorry to be sort of teachy here. You know, that's not what I mean to do. It's just things that I've learned from my own experience that I would like to share if it's helpful to other people. Sometimes we will find that our children will spiritually parent us if we allow the openness for that kind of interactive conversation um, as fellow spiritual journeyers. Right. And and I found just in the, you know, short five years that I've been a parent that even just carrying that posture with you 
will will give you pause in the midst of a moment where maybe your gut tells you I should be a parent right now, but you let your I don't know, not that I like to make these kind of separations, but you let your spirit stop you for a second. Um, one of the metaphors that our kids are being taught right now in their in their kindergarten class is this idea of their bucket being filled or emptied. So when <laughs> when you know when something's good, it fills your bucket, and we've we've adopted that metaphor, right? So at dinner time, what filled your bucket today? What emptied your bucket today? Uh, and <laughs> my one of my daughters. Um, you know, I was telling her, you got to clean your room. Like you got all this stuff all over the place. You got to put it away. And she is always re- resistant to that. And, <laughs> you know, she she gets into this place and she yells, you are emptying my bucket right now. I do not want to do this. This does not make me feel good. You're being mean. <laughs> and then my reaction initially was after, you know, trying not to laugh uh, because it was so hilarious and adorable, uh, but just to be the parent, well, I'm going to double down on what I just told you to do instead of stopping to recognize, okay, she's been given language to express her feelings and I need to stop in this moment and acknowledge, okay, this is how she genuinely feels. Obviously I have 2020 hindsight. My job is not to help her understand what she's going to understand in 15 years, but to, to, to meet her where she's at so that she can better process through. And, and I don't think I would have been there if not what you're talking about, Bonnie, holding that posture in my own heart and in my own life. And it gives you, you know, it doesn't always work, but I think for the most part, it gives me the leeway or the ability or the perspective to, to actually stop in those moments and not, you know, regret it later. And I think it's an intuitive posture. But it's countercultural mm-hmm. if yes, we grew up yes. in a fundamentalist hierarchical understanding of how relationships between parents and children work. <laughs> but relationships everywhere, faith, religion, society, everything was very uh, top down oriented. I just hearing the language of code journey has like sparked my brain because in my like work as a minister, I've realized the best like spiritual work I've ever done is when I recognize we're co-journeying in every single relationship I have, whether it's at a church or a hospital or with a family, unless you can give someone a sense of their agency and respect, you get, that's, that's step one. You don't get further on the stone path in the river, right? Like if you don't start with that first step, which is like, I respect you as a, a, a worthy whole spiritual being who has things to give and offer even to me, regardless of who you are. And if you don't start there, there is nowhere to go on a co-journeying spiritual path. So I like that a lot, Bonnie. And yeah, and I know we're trying to close this up. Can I say one <laughs> more thing, though? Absolutely. Yes. Um, I would say the other thing that I've learned is to talk with honesty and authenticity about one's own spiritual journey with your children. In developmentally appropriate ways at any stage. Because if you are, and I'm speaking especially to those folks who identify that they're sort of going through this spiritual metamorphosis right now, that is a an incredibly rich spiritual experience that could be an amazing resource for helping your kids understand how that works. Because the chances are in their lifetimes, they will probably go through something similar. So to talk with authenticity about that and think of oneself as a co-journeyer, it can be very powerful for kids to sort of see, hey, people go through this. My parents went through this and they come out on the other end and it's okay. And so Mm -hmm. I'll be okay. That's good. Well, on that, let us know what you think. Send in your questions, comments, concerns, stories, anything. Add your voice to this particular conversation, and you can do that at the show notes at irenacast.com slash 129. Wow, 129. Every time I read that number, it's like, wow. It like, goes up every it time. It goes up every time, <laughs> and soon it's going to be. Anyway, um, also on those show notes, you'll find all the relevant links and a complete list of all the other ways you can like, follow, contact the show and its hosts. That's irenacast.com slash 129. So Bonnie's going to stick around. And on the other side of the music, we are going to be doing a top three segment, top three childhood fears. Things might get real. Uh, So stay tuned and let's find out. (laughs) 
So our top three segment is exactly what it sounds like. We've picked our top three in a given area. Um, we've done top three vegetables at the request of Alan in the past. Um, that was a long time ago. Was a long time ago. I apologize for nothing. <laughs> Uh, we've done all kinds of top three, and this time we th- we thought it would be fun, related to the topic that we just had, as our top three childhood fears. Uh, so the th- you know number three being the least, and number one being the top, the one that maybe <laughs> guided our nightmares or whatever as we were children. Um, so let's let's just get into this because I have a feeling there's going to be a lot of stuff that goes along this. So let's see. So Bonnie, let's start with you. What is your number three fear as a child? I have 200, but (laughs) I could give you my top three. Yes. My number three is getting lost. I was terrified of that. It happened to me a few times, and then I would have nightmares about getting lost and no one ever finding me. Did you get lost at the beach or something? I got lost in the mall. That's pretty scary. A mall is really disorienting. Oh, yeah. It was super scary. I had to go, you know, and I was kind of quiet so i had to go find somebody to page my parents over the mall intercom and then i went back in the back room with these people it was it <laughs> like, a, like a criminal right like yeah the, the, the aesthetics of those rooms is like why am i here and you're not supposed to talk to strangers so that was right. a huge obstacle to overcome right wow all right alan number three I, I, I want to ask so many questions and delve into each one of these, but <laughs> I'll try not to. We'll wait for number one. We'll go we'll go deep on those. Let's keep it as light um, as we can regarding the topic. Yeah. <laughs> I just get really interested, you know. It's hey, your how chaplain. Does that, how does that play out in your life now? <laughs> it's the inner chaplain in you. It is. Um so number three for me is not really big. It was big at one point, it would be dogs. Uh there was um a moment when I was in third grade where We were getting a dog feeder next door from our neighbor, and he had a big Dalmatian that we played with a lot. And this Dalmatian had played with us over the years, and we were getting a dog feeder because we were leaving. And so my little brother and I ran ahead of my parents into the backyard to go play with the dog while my parents were getting the dog feeder, the automatic one. And he turned on us, and he, like, chased my little brother And I, like, pushed my brother out of the way, and the dog brought me down and then latched onto my leg. And, like, I got nine puncture wounds, big old laceration on my calf. And my mom had to kick the dog. She kicked it super hard, and it still, like, latched on. And she kicked it really hard, and it went flying across the backyard. It was a really big Dalmatian. And we all ran out of the backyard, and my little brother had already run out and was crying in the closet somewhere. Slammed the door on the dog's head as it was, like, running out to try to get us again. And from then on, I had a really, like, just fear of dogs in general, (laughs) which makes sense situationally. But it really wasn't until I was probably 22. No, probably before then I started to heal a little bit. But definitely when I got my own dog and went to dog parks, there was this sense of, like, I'm standing around, like, 90 dogs at this dog park in Pasadena And I'm okay. (laughs) And they're running up to me. And there's some really scary ones that are massive. And they look like they could just take me down. And I'm okay. And so that for me was just like, I got over that real quick. But there was a period of time where dogs are pretty scary for me. Yeah, makes sense. Jeez. Well, regardless of what Disney tells you, Dalmatians are not good with kids. (laughs) They're (laughs) They're, they're, intense. they're, they're They're not good family dogs. Right. They're gnarly. Jeff, what's your number three? Uh, my number three is a tie, but they're related in setting, so I'm just going to put them out there. You can do that? Uh, you see, Jeff's going to sneak uh, in yeah, there. And do what I want. Um, but they're legit. Like I remember like these were conscious thoughts that I had, and they were uh, sharks and riptides. Uh, I spent most of my childhood at the beach, in the water you know, body surfing, swimming in the water, trying to swim out to the buoys and all that kind of stuff. And you always hear, watch out for sharks and watch out for riptides. And uh, they were constant fears when I was out there. Um, They're scary. I never got caught in one and never came by a shark or anything like that. But it was still, even now, if I'm in a water, like if something touches my foot or anything, freaks me out and I'm immediately done. Yeah. So sharks and riptides. Let's uh, let's circle back around, Bonnie. N- number two. <laughs> uh, number two is uh, getting kidnapped, which is sort of related to getting. You know, I grew up in the late seventies, early eighties in Southern California. Oh my gosh! I was aware of all the serial killers and right. you know um, 
So and I and I had to walk to and from school about an, a mile and a half each way. So yeah, it was terrifying. You know, if a car like slowed down next to me, I would just run away or and I had a couple of weird experiences too with people wanting to give me candy and Wow. How much of that was framed are weird. because you were female? Probably about 95%. Right. Okay, that's, yeah. yeah. I was going to say, I, I walked to school all the time. We had all the stuff on the TV about strangers. We had, my, my parents said, if something happens in the middle of the night, like you do this. But I still wasn't scared to walk back and forth from school, I guess, as a little little boy. Yeah, I was really mm. afraid. Interesting. Alan, number two? My number two, and this one, it progressively gets way higher. Like for me, dogs are like really low on my fear. I actually had a hard time thinking of a third one because the top two are the only like real fears I had. Number two is a crazy high fear for me. And it kind of lasted all throughout my childhood. Missing an assignment for school would be like ex- just one of the highest fears oh my goodness. possible. <laughs> the, I, there have been a, a couple times in my life where I went to class and somehow I didn't know an assignment was due or one was assigned and I didn't know about it. And my gut would just drop to the floor and I would feel like physically ill because I'm missing this assignment. So even to this day, I get that wow. stuff all the time. Yeah. I bet your teachers loved you. <sighs> yeah. I mean, it depends if they had their own personal junk. Maybe they didn't. <laughs> that Alan, he asked a lot of questions. But yeah, you should see some of the. The stuff that they wrote in my yearbooks over the year, like they loved me, but they were also like, yeah, this kid has a lot of energy. <laughs> I was so curious all the I time. Believe you it. Know? Some things never change, Alan. Some but things never change. Some things don't change. Very yeah. conscientious. Yeah. What about you, Jeff? My number two is bullies. Well, it didn't help that I was myself and group of friends were always antagonistic to towards school bullies you know, the thrill of the chase or whatever. Um, but I saw some pretty rough things uh, from bullies. Uh, one of the kids that we knew was grabbed by these three bullies and like literally like golf balls were bounced off of their head and they would go like after it hit their head, like 10 feet in the air, like they were getting them hard. And then um, one time when I was walking to my friend's house, so I lived in this apartment complex. It's probably about five, 600 apartments, six different playgrounds at various different locations. And uh, one time I was walking to my friend's house and I got, I got jumped by these two older teenage girls and they pulled me by my hair and started cutting away. And it was, it was traumatizing as a child. So I was always, and I didn't have like I had adults in my life. Wait, that happened to you? Or no, it happened, happened to, to me. someone else. Happened to me. I didn't. Most know Most people that don't happened. know that. See, look what you've done. You've uh... <laughs> yeah. That's de- I've known you for a long time, man. Um, wow. So uh, and and I always had like I had a couple older cousins, but I only saw them like maybe once every year at Thanksgiving that I kind of looked up to. But I and I had adults and then I had peers, but I never had like older kids that I would look up to. So they were always kind of. A little scarier to me. Just like, I don't know about this. You know, what if they're going to beat me up or whatever? So, so yeah, bullies uh, was my number two. I mean, if you had that experience, that totally makes sense. Right. Wow. Yeah. All right. So let's, let's reveal. Are we really going to do, do, <laughs> no. do the number one? I'm scared to do the number one. I wonder if our number ones will be similar. I don't know. I don't know. I don't think, I don't think so. Maybe. My number one is going to hell. Wow. Really? Yeah. That's deep. I did not have a fear of that at all. And the reason why is because I didn't have that coming to Jesus moment ever. And I was so worried that, you know, that was going to cause eternal damnation. Like junior high or younger? Younger. Probably like eight to 10 ish. I was really worried about that. Wow. That's pretty heavy. Yeah. I wouldn't want my eight year old. (laughs) <laughs> going to bed afraid they're going to go to hell if they die in the middle of the night. I was afraid of, of my relatives going to hell because like they were Catholic or whatever. That's what I was taught. So I remember that in adolescent days, but that'd be a lot to, to go through as a kid. Yeah. Yeah. It was a lot. And I know I wasn't alone in that and not, at least not in my community, but hmm. yeah. Wow. Well, for me, number one, uh, I had night terrors until I was 10 years old. Um, And they were nightmares that you couldn't wake up from. They were still ongoing when you did wake up. And I had something called Alice in Wonderland syndrome, which was um, really scary for me as a kid. And I had through a lot of experiences until I was about 10 years old. Wow, Alan. Yeah. Yep. 
See this? You are a spiritual child. <laughs> uh huh. <laughs> Special little boy. <laughs> well, there you go. That's my number one fear. It's intense. Yeah, yeah. You know. You know what's funny is I would not trade that for thinking about I was going to hell. That seems even worse to me, to be honest. That's like existential dread for for a child. However, the it is existential dread, but the um, process of rejecting that fear was very powerful. So if I hadn't have had the the fear itself, I wouldn't I wouldn't be where I am. That's cool. How about you, Jeff? What's your number one? I've already learned so much about you with your number two. Like I'm oh, excited. Oh. <laughs> What's your number one fear as a child? Uh, my number one fear, and this may sound very trivial, but it was it was legit, is public embarrassment. I did not grow up in a family setting where social graces were highlighted. <laughs> um, so going out in public, especially if there was some sort of conflict or something out of the ordinary that a normal person could take in stride. Like a hiccup in plan or, or something. It just didn't. It didn't work like that in my family. And on top of it, when I was when I was a kid. So when I say kid, I'm thinking like before eight years old. So pretty much it was just myself and my mom. She was a single mother. I was the only child for you know seven seven years. So we we were on food stamps. We were on public assistance, and, and things in the house were not kept up on. So you know I'd regularly have to go to school in the same clothes that I wore the day before, and they weren't always washed. And um, you know, kids are kids, so that stuff would be brought up. And then when that's brought up, at least in my generation or my sphere, you know, food stamps was an insult to another kid, you know, oh, you're on food stamps or whatever. And so when we would go to the store, I was always like, well, is someone from school going to be here and see my mom pull out these food stamps and all that kind of stuff. And then uh, so it, it was that coupled with the, you know, the the social aspects of how the family worked. So and I always just wanted to, you know, just like any kid just fit in. So so maybe fitting not fitting in is probably more accurate than just social embarrassment or whatever. But that's, that was, that was, that was a thing that ruled the way that I dictated my life for a long time, for a long time, uh, into my late adolescence. So, uh, and still, I guess would creep up every now and then, but you know, that's a real scary thing. Cause that leads into your like second biggest fear, right? Like you get bullied for stuff that kids, right? Yeah. They, yeah, I guess they were, they were connected in a certain way. Um, but the bully thing, I was thinking more in terms of, physical assault um right because the that yeah i always thought of bullies as older so peers it would just be anyway oh embarrassment in front right. Of peers. right 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 yeah. so yeah that was that was my number one fear so i feel like before we close out the show let's cleanse the palate <laughs> let's uh <laughs> let's let's just can we acknowledge jeff that you're you're doing very public things now and you have totally overcome that that's pretty well, cool Right. <laughs> Let's not get into it anymore. Um, uh, least, <laughs> I've reached my limit. Or at least you're leaning into it. Right. Right. Exactly. Uh, yeah. That's, so that's so let's key. let's cleanse the palate before we close out the episode and just one amazing thing that you loved about childhood. Quick, <sighs> rapid fire. Bonnie, let's start with you. Climbing trees. Yes. Nice. I love to climb trees. Love it. I still do. Aw. When's the last time you climbed a tree? A couple weeks ago. There we go. Really? I like that. Alan, one thing from childhood. Rapid fire. Go. The first thing that comes to mind um, is me outside on a little cement block at the bottom of our outside staircase, uh, sharpening sticks into spears and bows and arrows so that we can go hunting together, like with our twine and (laughs) like spears and stuff up in the mountains. It was the greatest. You just, if you just kept rubbing it on the concrete, it would get really sharp. And I thought that was amazing. Nice. All right. And me for, it would be bikes, riding bikes everywhere. I lived in an apartment complex, like I said, and we just would go everywhere. Um, that and urban exploring, uh, we'd, we'd explored a lot of drainage tunnels (laughs) and it was awesome. All right. So then that will do it for us this week. Uh, Bonnie, how can people find you? On, on the socials, the interwebs, things that you have going on, what's the best way to, to, to connect people to your work? Um, I have a, a web page called soulfamily.us, and I have you know lots of things that I do, and there's a few blog entries on there too. And then I'm at Parkside Community Church in Sacramento. It's a United Church of Christ, and there's a lot on that website as well. 
You also offer spiritual direction, right? Yes, I, I, I offer spiritual direction for kids, youth, families. Can you do that over parents. the internet or does someone have to be with you physically? Uh, we can do it over the phone. Yeah, well, or go. internet. Sounds good. Well, all that information, again, as usual, in the show notes at irenacast.com slash 129. Alan, how can people find you on the interwebs? Facebook, facebook.com backslash Rev Alan O'Brien, A-L-L-E-N-O-B-R-I-E-N. Um, and then you can find out I – write, I write for a bunch of different stuff. But if you want to interact with me, just add me as a friend. Sounds good. And you can find me on all the socials at Jeff Manildi and on the second and fourth Thursday of every month to my other podcast, Divine Cinema. And you can find all the information there at divinecinema.net. We got some good movies coming up. Um, Our last episode was A Thief in the Night, which was a lot of fun. Good conversation. And we have some. Are you going to do the Trump prophecy? No. No. (laughs) We were sent a trailer for the Trump prophecy. Um, by a friend of Alan's, but I had already actually run across it and ran it by everyone, and we agreed there are certain things that we are not willing to sacrifice and watch for the sake of the craft. And uh, maybe when it's not so fresh, like after all is said and done, we might revisit years that. From now. <laughs> but uh, I'm not even. I'm not. If you want to find it, find it. I'm not going to put this in the show notes. It's just a movie about yeah. the Trump prophecy, and if you. If you come from a fundamentalist or evangelical background, you can guess what that might be about. So, no, we are not doing that. But we do some other fun movies. So check that out, divinecinema.net. As for Irenicast, don't forget to subscribe to the show to never miss an episode. We're available on all major podcasting platforms, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, and many more. And while you're there, if the platform allows it, leave us a rating and or review. Uh, We're always looking for more and more ways to hear from you. You can also find out our listener survey at irenicast.com slash survey. The information you give there is super helpful as we move forward and continue to evolve the show. That's irenacast.com slash survey. So for this week, I'm Jeff. I'm Alan. And I'm Bonnie. Thanks for joining the conversation. 